Bienvenidos, Hush Amadid, and welcome Anne Arundel Community College learners from the CTS 130 Section 402 course for the spring 2021 semester. This is the Cisco Networking Academy Introduction to Networks Version 7 course curriculum, and in this tutorial video, we're going to turn our focus away from packet tracer activities that were pre-staged for us, and we're now going to investigate Lab 2.9.2, where we're going to do basic switch and in-device configuration. So very similar to packet tracer activity 2.9.1, which we just completed. But now we're going to learn a whole new set of skills. We're going to build a packet tracer topology from scratch. And it's going to look very similar to the packet tracer 2.9.1, except we're going to have some different addresses and we've got some different questions you're going to be asked to answer. So let's go ahead and dive in to a blank slate on packet tracer here. So this is sort of our uh, blank slate that we're going to be working with. And the first thing that we need to do is we need to build our topology out. Well, we're going to grab two PCs. So we'll come down here and you can see the network devices and in devices. I'm going to grab two PCs and I'm going to enlarge this. Don't worry. We're going to make this much larger here so it's a little easier to see. And then I'm going to need to grab two switches. Now, the switches that we're going to grab are 2960s with iOS 15.02 LAN base K9 for the image. Now, what you'll notice is if you look at the network devices here, and specifically down below the switches, you can see there's a 2960 here. The problem is, is that 2960, if I bring that out and we click on it and we come to the CLI, what do we notice? Yeah, that this 2960 that's located here is running the 12.2 code. Well, that is not the code we need. So let's close that window. I'm going to click on the little X up here, the third icon over. And I'm going to say, because I'd already selected the switch, I'm going to say, yes, let's get rid of that. And now remember, you can see I still have the X here. So we want to click back over on the dashed square with the arrow. Now, where is the 15.x code 2960? Well, if you click on the miscellaneous folder here, you'll notice that a 2960 is sitting over here. This is going to be our 2960 that we're going to use in our topology. So let me move these things up a little bit. Let's try to line things up here. So we now have two switches and two PCs. We're going to hit, and I'm to blow this up, I'm holding down on my Mac keyboard the Command Cloverleaf key and then hitting the letter I. And that is how we can blow up the topology so that things are a little bit larger. And so we'll stay right in this space right in here. Let me bring that up a little bit more. All right, so now we need to connect these devices together. We're going to be using copper straight through connections. Well, where are the connections? Well, I would click on this lightning bolt here and you can see it says automatically choose connection type. Here's my console or the rollover cable that we would use to connect into the console ports. And there is the copper straight through cable. Remember, there was a crossover cable we used or that was already staged for us in the previous activity. And that's the black dash line here. That's a crossover cable. But we're just going to use a straight through cable. And on current Cisco networking devices, there's this ingenious, and again, this has been around for a while. There's this ingenious uh, feature called MDIX, Media Dependent Interface. And I think the X is uh, Exchange. Media Independent Interface, I have to look it up, but it's MDIX. And that will auto sense the type of cable that you plug in so that you don't have to go to the port and maybe make some changes to the port configuration. So we're going to use copper straight through and I'll click on the PC. We're going to choose the only ethernet port available. It's fast ethernet zero. And we're going to connect that up here to fast ethernet zero six. Now, this orange waiting dot here, that's spanning tree, and we'll be learning about spanning tree soon enough. Now, we're going to have a connection 
copper straight through between the switches from fast ethernet 01 over to fast ethernet 01. And now this is kind of nice because it allows me to sort of straighten things out here that might have been a little off, off kilter there. All right, and then we're gonna run our connection from PCB, fast ethernet zero, up to the switch, and this is gonna be fast ethernet 018. And again, we've got spanning tree in action there, and so we're gonna to have to wait, <coughs> excuse me, 30 to 45 seconds for that to switch to the green arrow, meaning that we would be forwarding. All right, so we've got those things laid out, but you'll notice the names of the devices, right? Kind of like these random sort of names. And so let's take care of that by clicking on each of these devices here and let's blow out the screen a little bit. Let's come to the config tab and you can see the display name. It says PC0. Well, I want that to display PCA. That is the value that I want there. Now, for the fast ethernet interface, we also know that we have a static IP address that we can configure. And again, reference the Word document that you find in the course room. And our IP here for PCA is going to be 192.168.1.10. Now, when I hit the tab key, notice how automagically the dotted decimal subnet value is placed in there for us. And this value here is correct because an IP that starts with 192 would be considered a class C IPv4 address. And the subnet mask for a classful class C network is a slash 24, that CIDR classless interdomain routing notation, a slash 24 in dotted decimal fashion would be 255, 255.255.0. Okay, so we've got the IP address of the PC, we've got the name changed, uh, and everything looks good. So we'll go ahead and go to the desktop and we'll pull the command prompt up here. Let's take a look at what we might be able to do with the switch. You can see display name is switch 1, how about we just change that to S1. Now, I might be able to change some other things here, like the host name, but we're going to leave that to our command line work. And so we're going to get some practice there with that hostname command in global configuration mode. Let's pull up switch 2, and I'm going to change the display name to S2 to match our diagram. Then we'll go to the CLI, and let's give ourselves a little more room with which to work here. And then we'll come down to PC1, which we know we want to change to PCB. And while we're here, we can also go to the Ethernet interface and make our IPv4 address 192.168.1.11 and that subnet mask value is also correct. So then we'll come to the desktop and we'll click on the command window or the command prompt, sorry about that. And let's try to line PCA up over here with everybody else. All right, so we've got all our connections made. We've got the PCs configured and the IP addresses on the PCs have been done. And so everything looks pretty good right now. So let's configure basic switch settings. And again, I'm gonna be making some recommendations, providing you with some shortcuts that you can follow to make your CLI interface experience a little more enjoyable. You can see we are running 15.02 or 02 SE4 LAN base K9, and that is the version of iOS that we wanted to be running. So where is the iOS located? Well, if I say dir and hit enter, you can see that it's located here in the flash directory. And this is where we keep this binary compiled iOS file, which gets uncompiled and or decompiled, loaded into memory, and is used for the switch to run. So let's get into global config by saying conf t or configure terminal. And from global config, it's interesting that the activity wants us to prevent unwanted DNS lookups, right? Something that I have been talking about for a couple videos now. And you can say um, domain lookup or domain and then look up, you can see we're disabling that. So you can say dash look up as well, and it's gonna do the same thing. Again, what is that doing? That's preventing a typo from privilege exec mode from trying to resolve that 
what would have been a command, but we mistyped it, it's going to try to resolve it as a host name using DNS. Well, we're not using DNS and we don't want it to give us that translating message. Again, as a reminder, here's what that message would look like. If I use the enable command to go from user exec to privilege exec, and I happen to type in a command, maybe I wanted that to be the ping command, for example, and hit enter, the switch is going to treat that as if it's a host name, and that's what it does by default. So in order to stop that from happening, we enter no IP domain lookup. Now, the next thing it wants us to do is to provide an enable password, right? An enable secret password. So I'm going to say enable secret, but remember, you could say enable password. You would not want to do that. So we're going to say enable secret and then provide the password of class. Now, the next thing we're going to do and this is again very similar we're going to go to line con 0 where i'm going to put a simple password of cisco now remember that key word here login because by default if i say do show run remember you can say do in a global config sub configuration mode or from global config and run a command as if you're in privilege exec mode so when i say do show run and i go all the way to the bottom you can see that on the console line the password is set but where is the login command instructing that console line that, hey, this is the password and you need to prompt for that password when someone tries to log in to the console line. Now, remember, in the activity, I'm clicking on the devices. And in Packet Tracer, when I click on the devices, it's as if I'm connected to the console port. We saw in a previous activity, I can grab the console cable here. Now, this is not part of our activity, but it's a great review. How would you do this in a physical environment? Well, I would click on the RS-232 port and run my rollover cable, whoops, sorry, up here to the console port on the back of the switch. And again, on newer switches, sometimes you'll find a little sort of micro USB connector on the front of the switch. And in some cases, you'll have both. You'll have an RJ45 console port on the rear, and you'll have a micro USB connector on the front. And so that's how we would run this rollover console cable. So let's come over here. And we might as well do one this way as well, right? Now, not part of the activity, uh, but great to have because if for whatever reason my network connection, this cable goes away, I'm still connected to switch one. At least PCA is still connected to switch one. So we're going to add that in there. Now, a final command on the console line that whenever I configure a switch from scratch, and again, in a lab environment, you might find yourself doing this all the time, is always add in logging synchronous. And what this is going to help with is it's going to prevent logging messages that we see pop up on the screen in the console from time to time when we're connected to the console line what this is going to do is make sure that it gives us our prompt back with whatever we might have been typing at that time. And if we don't have this, whatever we might have been typing at that time on the CLI is going to be jumbled in with all of the logging messages that we're seeing coming to the console port right? To the console line, I should say. And so logging synchronous is a must, and it's going to help you out a lot in the long run. Now, remember, we have VTY lines here. And maybe I want to telnet or use the secure shell protocol, SSH, to connect remotely, right? There's a difference when I'm console then. It's assumed that we're connecting locally because we would have to be within reach of the console port and on the PC. So that's sort of considered we're connecting locally. Connecting remotely would be using a protocol like Telnet or SSH. So how do we deal with those VTY lines? Remember, there are 16, 0 through 15 by default to which people can connect. So we want to go ahead and say line VTY 0 to 15. 
And what are we going to do? We're going to set a password of Cisco. Now, the lab shows you to type in the login option. However, remember, do show run is the login option already there. It is, but for whatever reason, maybe it's not. Let's type that in just in case. And so we say login. All right. Now, you'll notice that we can also do logging synchronous from the VTY line. So if the switch was configured to send syslog or logging messages to the VTY lines when you were connected, you would also want to have logging synchronous on. So this is kind of new. We didn't do this previously, but we're going to do it here. So what does our console line and our VTY line access look like right now? Well, there it is. They're both protected with the password Cisco. They both have logging synchronous on. And it looks like I forgot to type in login, line con zero. And this is another good reason to go back and take a look. To type the login command in there, we want to make sure that that is in there. So when we say do show run, we have all of our settings for the console line and the virtual terminal lines, those VTY lines. So now we're on to the next part of this activity. We're going to come up here and enter in our SVI. Again, I'm going to do switch one and kind of slowly walk us through. And then we're going to ramp things up and move to switch two. So we're going to create the switch virtual interface, the SVI, which is you could hear it referred to in some activities as the switch management interface. And all it is is a virtual layer three interface that runs in software on the switch that gives me the capability of pinging the switch or telnetting to the switch or SSHing to the switch. Because until there's an IP address on the switch to which I can initiate a connection, I'm not going to be able to remotely connect to the switch. Now, the console line, the roll or the console cable, the rollover cable, this RJ45 connection to the console port, sure, I can manage it that way. But what if you don't have that? What if you're trying to get to something that's in another building, another city, another state, another country? We need that layer three connectivity in order to make that happen. So we're on switch number one. Let's go ahead and go into interface VLAN 1, our switched virtual interface. Remember, VLAN 1 is the default VLAN. And it's the, the VLAN to which all ports, physical ports on the switch belong when that switch is first taken out of the box and powered on. And so let's add the IP address of 192.168.1.1. And we're in the same subnet, the same VLAN, the same broadcast domain as the PCs. And we're going to leave everything in VLAN 1 right now. Because again, we're trying to get our footing, build some scaffolding, and some foundation to understand how things sort of work before we get into creating new VLANs. All right, so what else do we need to do? Well, remember, if I say do show IP interface brief, we're going to get a whole bunch of output. And at the very bottom, it's going to show me VLAN 1. Remember, we can parse that output by using the pipe. In other words, what that pipe means, and this is a Unix um, convention here. What that pipe means is send the output, which is all of what we just saw here, send all of that through this filter and include only lines that begin with a capital V or have a capital V followed by a lowercase l. And let's pull it away a little bit there. And you can see we get only the line we're interested in. And that shows me right away, well, the interface is administratively down. It has been shut down. If we say do show run and come down toward the bottom, here is interface VLAN 1. And there's the shutdown option. So how do we unshut it? Well, we say no shutdown, meaning bring that port up. So if we run the command where we parse the output, right, we send it into the filter include, we can see the interface is now up, up. And if that is true, 
I should be able to ping, sorry. And before we do that, let's say ARP A. Let me take a look at my ARP cache. There are no ARP entries here. So I don't have any layer two to layer three mappings cached on the PC. So when I say ping 192.168.1.1, the PC doesn't know the layer two information for that layer three IP address right there, 192.168.1.1. And so it's going to send an ARP request out, an ARP query saying, hey, I'm trying to get to 192.168.1.1, but I don't have the layer two information for the data link layer, for the frame that I'm going to need. How do I get there? And that's where you're going to see the first packet is going to say request timeout because while we sent the ARP packet out, the ICMP packet that was also waiting to go out timed out on us because we didn't have the necessary information to construct a layer two or the layer two information. We needed the layer two info. And so here is the MAC address for the switch. And we can now see we have an entry here that corresponds for the layer three information for 192.168.1.1. We have the corresponding physical MAC address, that 48 bit value that we could now connect to when we run the ping command without having an ICMP packet timeout because it's in our cache. And I believe on Windows, it might be uh, five minutes that it's gonna sit in the ARP cache before maybe it times out. And then we would end up in the same scenario where we'd have to send an ARP packet out. But that's the process. That's the address resolution. We're resolving the fact that we know the layer three information, but I need to resolve that layer three information to the layer two information before I can send that frame out on the wire up to the switch. But now we know where that's going to go. All right. So that takes care of the SVI for, oops, sorry, for switch number one. So let's go back to switch one. Let's enter in our message of the day. So I'll type exit to get back to global config. We'll say banner MOTD, and we'll just simply put in here, um, must be authorized or log off, oops, sorry, log off now, right? So some sort of legal uh, message. So now we're gonna save our configuration. Remember, I can say do copy running config to startup config. This is one way to save our config. Now, the other way is shorter. I could say do write mem or just WRI mem. And I, I always say write mem. Um, I believe on real iOS, you could probably say do WME and that's gonna work as well, but I've just had it, right? I type write mem, right, or rye mem. And that would save the configuration for us as well. Now, where is that startup configuration maintained? Well, remember that's maintained in NVRAM. Oops, sorry, do dir question mark. You can see we're not gonna get that context sensitive help, but we know it's in NVRAM. Now, I don't need the colon, but you could put the colon if you wanted to at the end. So be aware that both ways work. And here is my startup configuration, right? So that if, and this is non-volatile, meaning if the switch were to power off and power on right now, this is the configuration that would get loading, loaded into the running config of the switch. And so we would have a copy of the configuration from when we last saved it that the switch would use when it boots. And that's held in non-volatile random access memory. Okay, so that takes it uh, all the way up to the point and give me just one second here. So display the current configuration. I can say do show run, right? Because again, remember I'm in the sort of this global config mode. If I wanted to get out, to privilege exec and then just say show run, we could do that as well. So there's our current config and it says display the iOS version. Well, that's show version and there's our iOS version and check the connection or display the status of the connected interfaces on the switch. Well, how do we do that? Well, that's our show IP interface brief. What if I told you only show me the interfaces that are up, either layer one or layer two is up. You could say, 
show IP interface brief and pipe it to include up. And so there are the interfaces right now that are up. So we'll notice that there's an issue here because let's go into interface fast ethernet 01. We wanna bring that up. That's the link that runs between the two switches. Now you'll notice it still stays red with the arrow pointing down, meaning if I say do show IP interface brief and include fast ethernet 01, and sorry, it's gonna be um, fast ethernet 01. You can see that 01, we end up with all of these other things that had the 01. So we see 10, but it trims it down a little bit. Now there are ways to go further into the string we're trying to match. I'm gonna leave those out right now. Um, but again, you can see that it's down, down. And the reason it's down, down is because the other side is shut down. And so when we go to switch two, we're going to fix that as well. And you know what I just noticed? I never changed the host name to switch one. All right. So we'll type in, we'll say write mem and save our config. And now we're going to go ahead to switch number two and do all the same configuration tasks we just did on switch one, but we're going to do them a little quicker. So we're going to get into global config. I'm going to say host name, switch two. Let's knock that out. We're going to say no IP domain lookup to make sure that we're not doing DNS resolution on what could be typos. Then we're going to enable the secret password. We're going to put an enable secret password on here of Cisco or I'm sorry, class. And then we're going to go to our console line. Remember, we want logging synchronous on. Then we're going to say password Cisco and log in. Then we're going to go to the, sorry, line VTY 0 to 15. So all of our VTY lines. We're going to say password Cisco, login, which is already there, and then login synchronous. And so that takes care of the console line and the VTY lines. Now let's go into the interface, the switch virtual layer three interface for VLAN one. And we're going to add in the IP address of 192.168.1.2. That's a slash 24 or in dotted decimal notation. It's going to be 255, 255, 255, zero. And then remember, we need to say no shut to bring that interface up here in this packet tracer activity. So do show IP interface brief, pipe it to include VL, and there's my interface. And if this is true, that the interface is up, up, if this interface was up, I should be able to ping not only PCB, but PCA and switch one. So let's bring that interface fast ethernet zero one up by saying, no shut. And you'll notice that the link did not go green. Let me make sure. Did I do fast ethernet zero one? I did. So let's come back over here and make sure that we got the command in there. Interface fast ethernet zero one, no shut. And over here on the switch, interface fast ethernet zero one, no shut. And for some reason it's reporting that that is down. So this might be packet tracer. So let's save our config on switch two. On switch one, I'm gonna save the config here as well. We're gonna say write mem, and I'm gonna reload switch one. And sometimes things will get hung up, and I'm not clear as to why that interface is still down uh, when it should be in the up, up state. So here we are back to switch two, and we've got some configuration work that we can knock out here while we're waiting for the reboot to finish. Let's put our banner message of the day um, must be authorized. Log off now. So we'll put that in there for our message of the day. Uh, and then let's make sure that we've got everything else configured. We do. And so here we're going to go ahead and type end to get to privilege exec. And we'll say write mem to save our config. So show run is going to display the configuration. Let's look at fast ethernet at zero one. Yeah, it should be up. And it's not. And then we're going to go ahead and display the iOS as simply show version. You can see that we're running 1502 and display the status of the interfaces, show IP interface brief. And again, fast ethernet 01 still showing down, down between the two switches. So let's write mem, let's go ahead and save our config and 
we're going to reload this switch just to make sure. And again, it reloads. It's going to reboot much quicker uh, than a real switch. And so it's not that big of a deal to make that happen. So from the PC, we're going to try to ping switch one and two. However, we've got this problem here with this link. So again, fast ethernet zero one is up. It's been no shut. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to select that link and we're going to come over here. We're going to remove that link and I'm going to reconnect with the straight through. So fast ethernet zero one, fast ethernet zero one. And again, it's still showing down and it asked for a straight through. It did not ask for a crossover cable. I'm wondering if that's why it's acting like this. Well, let's let's give it a try. Let's remove. <clears throat> We're going to remove the straight through and let's drop a crossover cable in here and I'll be shocked if. Wow. OK, so that was the problem. It didn't like the straight through cable. It wanted the uh, cable right here, the crossover cable. Now, again, you can use straight through cables between switches. So don't feel that you can't use a straight through cable. You can an MDIX will sense whether it is a straight through or a crossover. Uh, the 568A, 568B. And so we've got everything up here. And again, that's going to come up in just a second. So on PCA, let me go ahead and ping 192.168.1.1. This is switch one. And do we have a timeout? Did maybe the ARP cache timeout and clear? We did. Now that link is up. So I should be able to ping dot two. And again, do we have the layer two information in our ARP cache to get over to switch two? We didn't, but now we do after the ARP. So if I say ARP A, you can see that we have that information. What about to get over to 192.168.1.11, which is PCB? And let me double check that address. Yep, that's it. And you can see that we can get over there because we now have all of that ARP cache information here. Right. So let's check from PCB. Can I ping the 192.168.1.1? And again, what about the ARP cache on PCB? Might not have it in its ARP cache. It does now, though. And you can see that by saying ARP A. I'm sorry, ARP A. And so I've got switch one and PCA because I had already pinged from PCA. And now let's ping um, switch two. So we've got connectivity and we have a couple questions that we need to address reflection questions at the end. So why are some of the fast Ethernet on the port on the on ports on the switches up and others are down? Well, some are up because things are plugged in and then the other ones are down because nothing is connected. What could prevent the ping from being sent between the PCs? Well, it could be that you have a straight through cable here in this package racer activity that prevented it. Obviously, the port stayed down down. So that might be it. Maybe the interface is shut down on one side or the other of this link. That would prevent connectivity uh, or being able to ping between PCA and PCB. It could be that this port that the, that the PC is plugged into on its respective switch is down. What command uh, to use to display the current configuration? Remember, that was show run or show running config. If you're in a sub configuration mode, do show run. And what command did we use to display the iOS version? Well, that was show version. Or if you're in a global config sub configuration mode, do show version. All right. Well, I think that we've kind of hammered out the basic in device configuration and basic switch configuration. We've learned some really nice shortcuts and some value add commands that are going to help us parse the output that we're seeing in order to get only what we're interested in. And we learned that in the packet tracer activity there, that a straight through cable is not going to work between those two switches, or at least it didn't in this case. And we had to use a crossover cable. All right. Well, that is going to do it for lab 2.9.2 basic switch and in device configuration. I hope this is helping you in your studies. And again, download packet tracer, experiment, mess around, create topologies and see what works and what doesn't. That is the best way to learn, hands-on. All right, thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next video.